Hello everyone, it's Mr. Vallejo. Welcome to biology class. Today we're going to take a look at the vertebrates and we are on our way up the zoological ladder. Uh, we started our journey with the periphera and we are now uh, past them and cnidarians. We've gone through all of the worm phyla we took a look at the mollusca and the arthropoda, and finally the echinodermata. And we are now on the uh, last of the major phyla in the animal kingdom. So let's get started. We're gonna take a look at the vertebrates. So um, let's see, I'll remind you that as we talk about animals, that an animal is a eukaryotic multicellular heterotroph and not just uh, a heterotroph uh, because these three characteristics are shared by fungi. Uh, we are heterotrophs that ingest our food. So these are some characteristics that all animals have eukaryotic multicellular heterotrophic organisms that ingest their food. In addition to that, we move from place to place, not like a plant. Plant can move, it can respond to light, for example, and bend toward the light, but it doesn't get up and walk around and uh, go across the street to in and out for a burger. Locomotion, movement. M most animals reproduce by sexual reproduction, but you might recall that as we looked at the periphera and the cnidaria, uh, they uh, may reproduce asexually as well. But all animals exhibit some type of symmetry. Most of them show bilateral symmetry. Um, we have some radially symmetrical animals and then the periphery, remember, are asymmetrical. So as we take a look at this, uh, this table, we can see that uh, we have gone through all of these, uh, the periphery cnidaria, the three worm phyla, the platyhomenthes nematoda, the nelida, the soft-bodied mollusks, the jointed-legged arthropods, the spiny-skinned echinodermata, and now we're on the chordata. Now we're going to spend most of our time on the vertebrates, but realize that the chordata have these characteristics. They have a dorsal hollow nerve cord. Uh, they have a notochord, pharyngeal gill splits, segmentation, uh, in, uh, endoskeleton, and a post-anal tail. We're gonna cover all those in just a moment. This is the organizing slide. We'll take a quick look at tentacles and lancelets and spend the rest of our time on the vertebrates. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look. So dorsal hollow nerve cord, those of you who are taking an anatomy class in your future, um, will need to remember that DHNC means dorsal hollow nerve cord. Um, you know these words, dorsal means it's on the back. Hollow, there's some space inside. And it's part of the nervous system. It's a nerve cord, so the dorsal hollow nerve cord. Now here's another abbreviation, NCC. NCC means the notochord. Now the notochord is a cartilaginous structure that um, is going to be replaced by uh, bone on, in most of our organisms, but also um, we'll see when we take a look at the chondrichthyes, which are um, fish that have a cartilaginous uh, skeleton. To see that the uh, notochord is not replaced by bone in that case. But the notochord then is uh, is for support, usually in the uh, in the larval stages. We're going to see that there are pharyngeal gill splits. Now you and I, we don't have gill splits. They would be right here um, in the pharynx region. Well, um, sometime in our in our development, all vertebrates have some some evidence of pharyngeal gill splits, as we do in, in the fetal stage. So um, these guys, uh, the gill slits are for, uh, for breathing primarily, but they also in some animals are used to trap food and then uh, we have some filter feeding going on. Segmentation, these are, uh, this is uh, evidenced by, by uh, lines on the body, uh, but uh, in, in our case in humans, we don't have lines on our bodies going across like a B and a black and a yellow band going and you know, the, you'll see that obvious, but, but there is in our development, uh, mesoderm uh, in blocks. Those blocks of mesoderm are, are called myotomes and those myotomes um, are evidence of segmentation. All advanced organisms, all advanced animals anyway, have 
have uh, some segmentation. So we show our segmentation in the developmental stages as uh, showing blocks of mesoderm. Vertebrates have an endoskeleton. That skeleton's on the inside. It is, uh, is advantageous, uh, it is better than the uh, skeleton on the outside. Um, the skeleton on the outside limits the, uh, limits the size of the organisms. Uh, they say that cockroaches will, will take over the world. Well, not if they're as big as an uh, elephant because they wouldn't even be able to move. Um, they'd be more pear shaped and, and um, all that weight would go down like that and you wouldn't uh, have any movement. So an endoskeleton, you can have that uh, supporting structure on the inside and this allows us to uh, rapidly move and take advantage of our environment. And then we have a post anal tail or some evidence of that post anal tail like we have um, in our skeleton. Okay, so these are the features we want to cover as vertebrates. Um, there are some chordates that have the cord, but they don't have the backbone. And so these um, non-vertebrate chordates are the tunicates and the lancelets. Um, I'm showing them to you here so that you understand that there are some few chordates that don't have uh, the vertebral column. And so we mentioned those here. You can see in this picture on the right, though, this... Uh, this lancelet, which is this is the only part you see, which is stuck out of the um, bottom of the ocean out of the, the sand sandbar. You might see just this stuff right here, but over here in white, you can see that there are the major characteristics of a chordate, a nodal cord, a dorsal hollow nerve cord, and pharyngeal gill plates. Now to be a vertebrate, vertebrates have a spinal cord and a backbone. So that vertebral column, that's what makes us a vertebrate. And here's a picture. This graphic uh, is something you probably uh, knew back in second or third grade. There are five different types of animals. There's fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. But we're going to tell you that there are seven because there are three distinct types of fish that are different from each other. So as we take a look at the characteristics of the vertebrates, vertebrates have a vertebral column, a skull, and a neural groove. Here's the bird vertebral column. This is the backbone, all right? Um, the skull is a, is a, protects the brain and it has uh, bones that are fused together. This is the graphic that shows the neural groove and the development of the groove. This is a cross section, right? If you were to cut me right here, um, this would be the back. And then during development, what happens is these ectoderm cells move into the inside internal portion of the body like that. And this is the outside and this is the inside. It start to move in like that. Well, when it does that, it's called an invagination. And what happens is these guys go in and then form that tube all the way across the, the back. And you can see it's, it's hollow and it's made out of the same uh, germ layer cells that the skin is made out of. So we have the ectoderm um, right there. Now, again, there's seven classes of, of vertebrates. These are the three uh, different types of fish. You have the Ignatha, the Chondrichthys, and the Ossichthys. Then we have the uh, ones that you know, the amphibians, reptiles, birds, aves, and then the mammals. All right, so let's take a look at the jawless fish first. Now, the jawless fish, um, these are uh, uh, black jaws, obviously. Also paired fins, they do have characteristics of your typical um, typical vertebrate. They have a nodal cord, they have a, a, a skeleton made out of cartilage, and they are uh, parasitic. Um, the best examples are the lamprey and the hagfish. Um, you take a look at a picture of the, of the lamprey in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that it shows you the jaws of this, uh, or, but not jaws, but you can see the mouth of this fish. And you can see that it doesn't, it's just uh, it's like a sucker, sucks that and it doesn't open and close, it's just open like that. So these are the most primitive of all the vertebrates. Um, the next group of fish are the chondrichthys. Chondrichthys are the sharks and the rays. These guys have a cartilaginous skeleton. 
skeletal men are cardinal agents. Some characteristics that they have are in their environment, they are the predator, as you can see in this picture right here. Again, their skeleton is made out of cartilage. They typically have a large dorsal fin like this right here, typical of a shark. And then uh, actually, if you've ever felt shark skin, you know that it is smooth going one way, but sharper if you go back the other way, much like if you pet a cat, it's nice and smooth. And then if you pet it the other way, that cat's gonna rear back at you going, Arr! well, what's that? about, well, these denticles, it's harder to see in this picture, but what happens is uh, they, they go, in this picture, it goes from left to right. No, that's wrong, right to left. And it goes up the screen like that. And and what's happening is that is you can feel it one way and then uh, you can feel it smooth one way and the opposite side, it's, it's kind of rough. Um, also makes it a little more, um, uh, uh, cutting through through the water, hydrodynamic, and uh, it just uh, is able to swim even more quickly uh, with these uh, denticles that are microscopic. And you can see in this, this is a picture of the microscopic version of the of the skin. Some uh, some of their behaviors, or uh, anyway, specialization. They have sinuous movement, like that's the the movement of a sine curve. So it goes back and forth like that. So if you were to look at a shark from above, you would see that it was moving back and forth like that. Uh, they have large pectoral fins also. Pectoral, the pectoris that, that, that alludes to the chest region. So they have fins right there. And then they also have, uh, uh, they breathe in an interesting manner. And these guys, uh, uh, the chondrichthys, they need to move, they need to keep water moving past their gills in order to breathe. So, um, so sometimes what you'll see is uh, sharks that are sitting on the bottom of the, um, of the ocean, still um, swallow, eh, maybe swallowing water to get it to go past the gills. So they're moving water that way, even if they're not moving, and they're, they're pumping water through their gills. There's some that uh, instead they continuously move even so ever so slowly through the water. And as they do that, then the water passes uh, uh, through the gills and that's where respiration takes place. All right, the third group of fish is the bony fish and the bony fish uh, have uh, not a, cartilaginous skeleton, but a bony skeleton. So obviously their characteristics, they have bones, they have a swim bladder. The swim bladder is a, um, a structure that allows them to go up and down in the water column. Uh, they have a particular scales. And um, the thing about the scales is that you can, uh, you, can, you can tell the age of a fish by looking at its scales. And uh, there are different types of osseophys here. Another uh, characteristic is it says up here is the lateral line. And there's the lateral line. It's kind of like your middle ear and has to do uh, with the, uh, the uh, balance and whether you're upright in the, uh, in, the, in the water column. And so a fish can tell because of, of the lateral line. Okay. Yeah, it's sort of like the cochlear uh, part of our ear and it has those tubes and that allows us to uh, have a sense of, of balance and whether we're upright or crooked or what. Okay, so there are different types of, here it says there are ray fin fish, lobe fin fish, and then the lung fish. These are all bony fish. And uh, so you can see here's some comments about the Ray fin fish, and it has to do with the, the matrix of calcium phosphate, so it's a hard chemical. And uh, again, they have a, a swim bladder. Um, okay, here's a picture of a lobe fin fish. And uh, here you can see their muscular fins, as it says in the text, supported by bone, the lobe fin, and then the lung fish is. Uh, bony fish in a different class and they actually breed 
here are the, the lung fish. All right, going to the next group. The next group are the amphibia. Amphibia have a, uh, is, comes from the word, the Latin word, which means double life. Amphibians live in the water and the land, since they're most amphibian embryos and larvae must develop in water. And so they are the most simple of the land vertebrates. Here's the gentleman who leads a double life. He, uh, he's, uh, you think he's uh, educational and uh, good for kids. And then you turn around, he has that double life going on. That's Kermit the Frog for you. All right, here's some amphibians uh, and some comments about amphibians and their diversity. There are different types of amphibia which have moist skin. There's the salamander, there's a tadpole which will become a frog or a toad. And then uh, there's a, a poisonous frog right there. And these are, and I've never seen these except in a, in a collection. I've never seen them live, but these are Sicilians. Sicilians are not snakes or worms. They're actually amphibians. And, uh, and so there's a photo of them there. But all of these need some type of aquatic habitat for reproduction. That's why they're amphibians. They can be on the land, but they have to go back and uh, reproduce in the water. Um, even desert toads need to have a special mechanism so that they have liquid that their uh, fertilized eggs can develop in. So uh, they are linked to water that way. So all amphibians need aquatic habitats for reproduction. Some fun comments about amphibia. Uh, their specialized physiology, as far as respiration goes, when you do a frog dissection, you'll notice they have very small lungs. That's because 40% uh, uh, of their respiration, their gas exchange occurs through their moist skin. So they also breathe through their skin in addition to these lungs. As far as reproduction goes, there's a couple of fun things to know. Here's a Suriname toad, and these are fertilized eggs that the male carries around until they hatch. Here is uh, Amplexus. Amplexus is when two frogs are getting together and they look like they're um, doing the wild thing, but they're actually not. Uh, they are releasing their gametes, their eggs in the sperm to the environment. So that's Amplexus. A male grabs a female in a particular way, which which uh, causes her to release her eggs and then the male releases his, his, uh, his contribution on top of those eggs. So that's called amplexus. All right, let's go to the next group. The next group are the reptiles. The reptiles are a diverse group as well. You have crocodiles and alligators, you have turtles, and then you have the squamata. Here is a, uh, an alligator and a turtle playing nicely, neither of them winning. Here is a, what is this? This must be a, looks like I can't tell from this view, but uh, if you take a look at, at there, uh, and then well, when I used to work at the zoo, we say if, if the snout is shaped like an A, it's an alligator, but it's more curved and it's a crocodile. So that's the difference between the alligator and crocodile. You can also tell by taking a look at the, at the closed mouth, and you can see in letter B, you have the uh, the bottom tooth coming up like this. And when when you have that, the crocodile. This is an alligator. This is a gopher tortoise, uh, sometimes called the California desert tortoise, as an example of a turtle. And the uh, uh, well, here's somebody at an alligator farm uh, from. Uh, uh, Japan is a popular kind of almost amusement park, I would imagine. And so uh, not, not very amusing to me, but do you see that uh, there's that alligator again? Here is a, um, here's a crocodile and a squamata, the term right there. That's probably a, an anaconda or, or a boa constrictor. And it is going up against that. The, uh, the alligator and the alligator lost that time. And over here, this comes from the movie Anaconda. 
here is a snake that uh, apparently has swallowed a man, but uh, that wouldn't be a very good bite, would it? Uh, squamata. Squamata are snakes. All right, uh, whether it's a snake or an alligator or a crocodile or a turtle, all snakes have these adaptations, um, which help them to become fully independent of the water. They have tough skin, they have an egg that has a shell, they have efficient kidneys, and they uh, have internal fertilization. So instead of releasing the eggs in the sperm to the environment, we have a internal delivery system that results in uh, fertilized eggs that are now inside the body of the female. So reptiles, uh, they are fully independent of water, unlike the amphibians, which have to go back to water. Now, before we go to the last two groups, um, we have uh, reptiles and amphibians and fish that we've covered. These are all ectotherms. Now, birds and mammals are what we call endotherms. An endotherm is an animal that uh, has an internal heat source. So if you take a look at this diagram, here is the snake, which is an ectotherm during, on a cold day. And here's a is the ambient temperature or environmental temperature. And then here's the body temperature going up right here. And so you can see as the environmental temperature goes up, the body temperature goes up for a snake. And so we incorrectly call a snake a cold-blooded animal, but when it gets over here, and a lot of these live in the desert, right? So in the desert, they're very warm-blooded animals. In fact, it could be above this level right here of what we would call a warm-blooded animal, which is an endotherm. And as an example, it's a bobcat. You can see the bobcat has an internal uh, energy source and that internal energy source keeps the body temperature um, high and constant. Um, just like you and I, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, that's our body temperature. But uh, if we vary from that, just by a few degrees, we get uh, shivers and shakes. Uh, or we uh, have an extremely high fever and we uh, have a, a very quick response to high fever. So temperature control in animals, um, there are ectotherms and then birds and mammals are endotherms. And here's a funny for you. What do you mean it's cold? It feels pretty warm to me, <laughs> says the cold-blooded snake. Uh, but again, cold-blooded is a, a relative term, and so biologists tend to not use that term because, uh, you know, like I said, a snake can be having a very warm internal temperature if it lives in the desert. All right, aves, aviary, aviation, all these have to do with flight. So birds are, are the animals that we know have flight. Their adaptations are they have wings for flight, they have weather, uh, feathers that, that allow them to fly, they have, they have hollow bones, so their weight is not too much. And here's something you don't think about, they have very efficient lungs. If you've ever been on a really fast roller coaster, you're screaming your head off, there comes a point when you're, you're going down 60 miles an hour, and your mouth's open, and you can't even breathe. Why is that? Well, because our lungs aren't aren't uh, built for that, but some birds are. And when they dive at more than 60 miles an hour, they can still breathe. Uh, it's like this, it's like they open their mouth and they, it goes back to a, uh, a, another portion of the, of the body and then the air comes back over the lungs and so it breathes that way. So it's very efficient flow. Some of the birds are actually flightless and uh, there are things like cassowaries and uh, emus, but you probably are familiar with uh, ostriches as the largest uh, uh, flightless bird. And then don't forget the penguins are flightless also. So the feathers are used for flight, but they're also used for heat conservation. If you've ever had a down mattress or down sleeping bag, um, you know that those are those are quite warm, and so those are the the feathers that are near uh, the body. Uh, they're shaped differently, kind of fuzzy. Um, they are uh, used for heat conservation to save save heat. 
And then if you remember a peacock, a peacock can use feathers for the attraction of mates. So the feathers are also used for mating. Here's some birds about to go into migration. Um, birds don't, don't go and migrate uh, just whenever, you know, it's like, oh, I guess, you know, I mean, fly north or fly south during certain times of the year, not like they have a calendar, but what tells them to go is when their feeding grounds are depleted, um, that would be the, uh, the clue or the cue for them to get going. So uh, migration depends on, on how the uh, resources are holding out. And then finally we get the mammals. The mammals have uh, hair and they also give uh, milk to their young. So for my graphics here, I have some mammals with hair. I think that is uh, it's Eddie Van Halen from uh, like Bon Jovi. Uh, uh, and uh, the who is that? That is a, uh, oh gosh, his name is, I'm forgetting things, but there, there you go. That, uh, that's Van Halen right there. You may remember uh, many of their songs like Jump, for example, or Right Now. Uh, and uh, here's a picture of, it uh, looks like a pup who is getting some milk and um, the mammary glands produce milk. Some interesting other characteristics of mammals. They have a four chambered heart, just like birds do. Um, they also have, a, mammals have a particular leg position. Their legs are underneath the body that makes it more efficient. And uh, we can run more quickly than other organisms and other groups. Uh, imagine a cheetah, cheetah or horse uh, running and their legs are underneath the body. Imagine a frog that has a, a, some huge, relatively sized uh, rear legs that allows it to hop along. So the leg position uh, results in high speed. Um, if you take a look at the picture in the bottom left, you can see that mammals have uh, different types of teeth, which are specialized. Uh, we have canines and incisors for cutting. We have molars for crushing and grinding. So um, we have specialized teeth. And then um, mammals have a cerebral cortex. So um, we are some of the quote unquote smartest animals because of the more advanced development of our brain. Um, also, uh, if you take a look at the diagram right here, it is the left side of the body that has uh, the oxygenated blood, the blood that is returning from the, from the lungs. And so in this picture here, they, uh, it's, uh, the oxygenated blood is red and it's coming back from the lungs and going to the left side of the body. Now this is, this is viewing it from uh, the viewpoint of a person who's on their back. So this would be their left side. And so that's why it says left side here. So this is now going to the rest of the body goes and uh, it is pumped uh, out through the, here it is, the aorta. And then it goes to the rest of the body. That's the oxygenated blood. The oxygen rich blood. All right, very quickly, I wanna go through the uh, groups of mammals and um, give you an idea of the diversity of mammals. Um, there are some that actually lay eggs like the platypus here. These are called monotremes, the duck-billed platypus. There's some that, um, that have a incomplete development. So these are the marsupials. The marsupials complete the development attached to the mother's nipple, which is inside a pouch. And here's, you can see Joey popping his head out. And inside of this pouch um, is a nipple and he stays there for, for a while before he comes out and uh, is uh, walking around exclusively. The rest of the mammals are what we call placental mammals. The placenta nurtures the embryo within the uterus. Here's a picture of a horse placenta after 
after the birth. So sometimes it's called after birth because it comes out later. First you have the, the, uh, the baby that comes out and then you have the uh, placenta that comes out. The placenta is the, the uh, connection between the, the uh, mother and the baby. And, and so uh, it's not a connection where, where there's a blood that is passing through, but the foods are diffusing from the mother's blood to the embryo and, um, and that's very efficient. Here's a zebra who has just popped out. You can see the afterbirth still on his uh, posterior, but um, the mammals will complete their development before birth, unlike the marsupials. They say that a giraffe, when it pops out, needs to be able to run within a few minutes in order to avoid prey. So those are the mammals. This is a famous uh, Russian polar bear. And uh, very cute. All right. So, um, so in the next several slides, it's not important that you know all of the um, mammal groups. But the key point is that there are many different types of mammals. And so I just want to um, let you know that uh, you don't have to memorize the different groups, but I just wanted you to know that there are, in, in fact, many different groups. So they're very diverse. First, you have the insectivora. These are the mole, uh, the voles, and, and it's said that the, uh, that all of the mammals came from this um, predecessor. And so these are still exist today, but uh, these are the insectivora. Uh, this is a group of <coughs> a group of voles that uh, have radiated out to the different other different groups. One group that looks fairly similar is the rodentia. And rodentia are about the same size as well, but there are a few that are quite large. And the world's largest rodent is the capybara. These are over 100 pounds and um, can uh, sit in a little pond. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it is, it's a large rodent. And you have the carnivora. And these are tigers. Tigers are actually much larger than lions. People forget that. You have the proboscidea. A proboscis is like a nose. So these are the elephants, and obviously. There's an Indian elephant. I can tell by its ears. And also, uh, it's a little spoiled. And it has its own toilet. Wow. Then we have the cetaceans. Um, cetacea. It's a group of whales. And so now we have some mammals who, have, who um, inhabit the aquatic environment, the marine environment. So we have a, a cetacean. Um, here are some serenia, which are the dugongs or the, um, the manatees. So you can see in that picture a better idea of their size. They're very slow moving. Um, in fact, the ones that you see in uh, in aquaria uh, are often ones that uh, had a run-in with the propeller of a boat, and so they're there to recuperate. Um, and uh, and so those are the uh, the the manatees. Of course, we have the chiroptera, which are able to fly. That's the only group that is, uh, mammals that that uh, have this capability. You have right here the artiodactyla. The artiodactyla are the even-numbered, even-toed ungulates. They have a particular digestive system, and they have an even number of toes. So camels and pigs are in this group. And it's another guy right there. Okay, but the mammals, uh, there, there's another group of odd-toed ungulates. The odd-toed ungulates are the peristactyla. 
And so you have the perissodactyla, the major group, or well, you have the zebras obviously on the left, and then the tapers. I think this one's a mountain taper right there. Um, tapers are interesting. I read that uh, sometimes a taper will eat uh, seeds and then the taper will get nourishment from the seeds which start to grow inside the body of the taper. It's kind of interesting. Some people say that if, uh, if you were gonna rank all of the different mammals, the top mammal might be the lagomorph because the lagomorph has a tremendous uh, respiratory system. They move very quickly. They reproduce rapidly. So these are the lagomorphs. The lagomorphs are rabbits and hares, which are, uh, you know, if, if you look at it and you think of it, has many, many uh, high quality characteristics the lagomorphs do. And uh, although the lagomorphs have some high quality physical characteristics, we are the thinking group. We are the primates. And so here's a group of pri primates there at Disneyland in August, because my birthday's in August. So they gave me a sticker as well as two of my kids right there. And uh, that was a fun day, you could see, but tiring for some of them, all right? All right, I want to close this lecture with a discussion of, of uh, two of my favorite animals. As you know, I grew up along the Central California coast, so uh, just a little bit inland, a town called Salinas, but we were only 20 miles from the ocean, and so uh, I, learned a lot about the ocean and visited the ocean uh, many times uh, in my youth. So uh, the gray whale is an animal that is found off the coast of Monterey as it's migrating from, from Alaska to Mexico. So I wanna talk a little bit about that. And then another of my favorite animals that's found off of Monterey, and we'll see that in a second. So these are the gray whales. The gray whales are cetaceans. Now, cetaceans can be classified as toothed whales or baleen whales. And the baleen is a, you know, it's used to strain things out, but, you know, they're about this big and, and uh, maybe even bigger. And, and baleen is, uh, it's, it's hard. It's almost like a, uh, almost like a bone-like material. So that baleen is used to filter, um, uh, but then some whales uh, have teeth. And so uh, like an orca has a, is a tooth whale. And so whales, porpoises, dolphins, all these are, um, are in the group cetacean. And the baleen whales are usually the largest of the whales. So the tooth whales are generally smaller. But looking at the gray whales, which is a baleen whale, um, you can see that this baleen whale has a, a lot of, uh, it has right here a big knuckle on the back. I have an arrow there. Knuckle on the back distinguishing the type of whale it is, is a gray whale. And uh, it has a thick layer of parasites on it. Now these, these parasites um, are stuck on there and uh, other whales will, swim fast and that, that high speed will knock these uh, parasites off. These are called whale lice or no, 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 these are, these are barnacles right there. But um, the, uh, the parasites will get knocked off by other whales, but gray whales don't swim as quickly. But they do have a thick layer of, of blubber. And so what does this blubber do? Well, it's, it's a big layer of fat. So it's their energy reserve. And it also provides insulation. The average temperature of the ocean is in the, in the 50s. And so it's too cold for us, but for whales, they have that thick layer of blubber. And they're storing food. And, and, and so they're essentially storing food in the form of fat in their blubber. <coughs> And again, they, they have a lot of parasites. Swim slowly. 
You said that whales are as intelligent as dogs and pigs. So for my graphic, I have a dog and a pig outfit. And then here is a dog that some might say looks a little like a pig. So that's how smart whales are. Smart as a dog or a pig or a dog in a pig costume or a dog that looks like a pig. These guys, gray whales, uh, live part of the year in their feeding grounds off the coast of Alaska, but then they um, they uh, swim down to their breeding ground in Baja, California. It's a long swim. I live right here, and they say that the best time to walk the blue whales is uh, the in the, around the end of January, February, um, because uh, you will see some whales that are still swimming down here, um, going south to Mexico, but then there's the other whales that are swimming back already. So it's a good time to watch for, for, uh, for whales, take a, uh, a day trip on a, on a sightseeing boat, and they'll often you to see migrating whales. Okay. Um, your comments about courtship. Uh, this is a male and a female. Um, and then also there is a, a male right here who's pushing the female so that these two can uh, come together. Um, and uh, so, because you're in the water, so this other male is pushing them back, pushing her back over that way, so you can mate. And here's that aerial picture of the Calvin Lagoon in Baja, California. This is an important thing for people who live there because this provides a, uh, an opportunity for ecotourism, provides local communities an opportunity to benefit some visitors to the area. They'll take little boats out. And I think people out to view uh, some of the actions that are going on there. And uh, it's so uh, important from an economic point of view. Okay, so the gray whale. The uh, other organism I wanted to take a look at, one of my favorite animals, the sea otter. And the sea otter lives, off, uh, lives in kelp forests. And they were once hunted for their fur, and they have the world's quickest fur. And in fact, they were almost hunted to extinction. But biologists found a pod of these guys um, off of Big Sur, Central California coast, and kept it quiet for many decades. So they were able to come back, and we're actually even transplanting some of these guys to. Uh, islands a little further south, like the, uh, the Catalina um, and uh, the uh, San Miguel, those islands. We're trying to get, uh, we've been trying to get sea otters to take hold in those islands for for many years. And so uh, they are off the uh, the uh, endangered species list. Um, because they have uh, they have come back. Um, the Monterey area is a national marine refuge, so they do have a lot of protection there. So there are like, the otters now. <clears throat> Here's a picture of the kelp beds um, where they live. The kelp forests only found in seven different locations in, in the world. It's because the water needs to be cold. And off the coast of California, our water is coming down from Alaska. So we do have colder water that's nutrient rich and it has to have a, a something for the, the, the kelp hold pass, which are like roots to hold on to. That doesn't happen very often, but it happens off the coast of California. And so that's why sea otters have found them in cup beds. Um, Sea otters exhibit temperature reg uh, uh, countercurrent heat exchange as a temperature regulation device. If you take a look at the picture on the right, there's a flipper, and you can see as the blood flows 
to the outside of the, uh, the, the flipper, and then the blood coming back is going to uh, transfer the heat in a favorable way. Take a look at the picture on the right. You can see that the ar arterial blood, the blood coming away from the heart, is always warmer than the blood going back to the heart. So if this is the case here, 3533, this warmer blood the heat is going to move over here before it gets to the outside, before it gets to the edges. So there's always a favorable exchange, a favorable, uh, uh, you know, uh, a flow um, from this side, the arterial blood to the venous blood. This is also true for oxygen, oxygen. Okay, that's why these guys can stand so long when they dive. Uh, here are the reasons that, that uh, they can dive. For, they can stay under for about an hour if they need to. They don't typically, but they can stay under for an hour. Um, they can go down as far as 60 feet for an hour. That's crazy. Uh, circulation stunted from the extremities. That means the blood doesn't go to the, to the edges of the of the, uh, the filters uh, and, and uh, stays in the core area. Uh, the lung, instead of trying to hold the breath, the lungs collapse under high pressure and the blood has a high degree, high concentration of oxygen. So that, these characteristics all together uh, are the reason why the, the audience can stay down so the long. Um, these are all adaptations to the higher pressure of diving into the ocean. So you don't want to hold your breath like this cat is, because that's not going to work. As far as food range goes, here's the there's a sea otter munching on a starfish. They also eat sea stars. They eat just about anything. And so these guys are called uh, pioneer species. Um, because, or actually, no, I'm, these guys are um, what we call keystone species. Because if you take the sea, out, sea otters out of the environment, then the whole environment uh, uh, collapses. Because what would happen is if you don't have sea otters eating the sea urchins and the, and the sea stars, then those populations would grow too dramatically too quickly, and that would kill the kelp for us. So because they eat all of these guys, these guys are what we call keystone species because of their uh, influence on the ecosystem. And if you don't like this picture, this is a, this is a sea otter who's floating on her back with her pup. That's the cutest thing ever. So, uh, to go and visit a, visit an ocean and find the kelp bed and look for some sea otters. All righty. Uh, so those are the core dates. And so uh, hope you've enjoyed this lecture. And, uh, and thanks for coming to biology class. I'm Mr. Vallejo. We'll see you later. <laughs>